So welcome to Teaching to the Converted. This is a new podcast put together by a couple of teachers, hopefully for the interest of students, educators, teachers, researchers, anyone with a passing interest in education. So I'm Sam. And I'm James. And together, um, we've got about 10 plus years of experience across the state and the private sector. And we have a whole range of interests in uh, teaching education, creativity, design and education, and a whole bunch more besides. So James, what are we talking about today? Well, today is the idea is going to be like an introduction podcast, so you can get to know us a little bit, what we're trying to do, and um, what the theme of this whole podcast is going to be, so you can get a feel for it, and it's not like, you know, super weird. I think the idea originally, correct me if I'm wrong, was like some kind of long form podcast about education. A little bit, yeah, a little bit of stream of consciousness of thoughts, ideas, what we've read, what we're interested in, what we don't know about, what we've got questions about, just a chance to kind of explore some areas of our practice, share some things we've learned, and probably admit to the massive gulf in our understanding. Yeah, that's the, I mean, personally, the main reason I'm doing this is so that I can be a better teacher. Just an hour a week of like talking about and reflecting on best practice cannot be a bad thing. No, and the main reason I'm doing this is to satisfy my massive ego, uh, so I don't get enough of it in the classroom, so this is just a real chance <laughs> to get to a wider audience. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> teaching, talking to 20, 24 kids at a time is one thing, but it's not thousands, is it? That's what we're after at the end of the day. Absolutely. So, we kind of figured for episode two onwards, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, we would talk about some of the different teaching standards, so for those in their PGCs and for those newly qualified teachers, or even if you've been in, in the career, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 years, and you're still looking for ways to improve and kind of brush up on those standards that'll be the aim of the future episodes but today like james says it's mainly introductions so we've put together i suppose a questionnaire like an interview session to kind of see what our introduction to teaching was like yeah that's the idea we've got like a a list of questions all about sort of pgce and onwards um and should we i'll just i'm just gonna fire you one why did you get into teaching sam great question fair enough um it was never my intention I never planned it originally. Um, So when I was a teenager, I must have been about 14, 15, 16, dead into my sciences, dead into my maths. And for me, it was going to be medicine. Um, Well, hold on. Backtrack a bit. Age seven to eight, there was like an astronaut period. So post that astronaut period of of wanting to fly up into space, it was medicine all the way through to my A-levels. So one of the first things I did when I started my A-levels was look for some voluntary work. So I volunteered back at my old secondary school. a chance, I guess, to, to give back, or it was just familiar ground. So I went back and I did a bit of help in science classes and in maths classes. And that's probably where I kind of initially got the bug for teaching. The so, I, yeah, a little bit. Can, we, can you call it the bug? I feel like it is a bug. I think so. And Once you've had a taste, you can't, you can't go back. <laughs> yeah, it kind of doesn't go away, does it? It's, no. I don't know, the, the herpes of careers. <laughs> Just once once you've got ever it, ever mean to get it. <laughs> once <laughs> but yeah, but once you got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I went through my A levels. I actually found on reflection, medicine wasn't for me, and I was really interested in the science, but I didn't have the interpersonal skills. I didn't have the kind of the interest in the patient like I should have done, which perhaps I would do now. So I instead went for a science degree. So I went for a biology degree, pure biology, because that's what I was I was interested in. Um, and even during my degree, I, I did some more voluntary work, and I also did my entire final year project. It was an education-based project, not a research-based project. So it was working in schools, communicating science. Um, so after that, that's where I kind of really got the bug and went and did a PGCE. Uh, so that was my my introduction. That was my kind of reasoning. What about yours? How do you get into teaching? Well, originally, uh, we'll go back to maybe high school. I um, I was good at sort of two things. It was maths and science and art. Um, and my parents sat down, and we all sat down, and was, I was like painfully ambivalent about what it what it was I wanted to do. Um, so we sat down and we thought, what is a good combination of those things? And we went, landed on architecture, I thought, something to aim towards. My dad was an engineer, seemed like a clever thing to do. I was like, we'll aim towards architecture. So I applied, went all the way through GCSEs and sixth form originally, attending to do architecture, got to my UCLASS application, realized that I was never going to be good enough at the art side of it. Um, to do anything other than designing conservatories and extensions. Um, So I I knocked that on the head and thought, what would I actually be good at? Um, And physics and maths were my two best A-levels, so I was like, we'll go for that. Um, So I decided then, actually, when I was still at school, well, well, sixth form, that I wanted to be a teacher. Okay. So from there, I uh, reapplied to university, changed my UCAS application to physics and maths, 
um, at the University of Liverpool. Um, I then just sort of went went for that. Went to went to the university. Um, before I went, went to university, I should also say I was a I was involved in scouts quite heavily. I was a, I was a cub leader um, for a number of years. Really, really enjoyed that. And I knew then that I enjoyed working with young people. I had good relationships with them. I got on well with the kids. Um, so I thought physics and maths, strong subjects. I knew there's a shortage of teachers in the subjects. I knew I was good with kids. I was like, let's do it. I'm going to be a teacher. So I went to university. Uh, studied physics and maths there all the time, sort of trying to tailor it. I was doing work experience with um with with schools, any sort of teacher scheme I could get involved with, I did. Uh, and then I did a, a module sim- similar to you, communicating science, which I found was just a, a breeze. Talk about something you know really well for like 20 minutes. I can do that. Yeah, um, not just talk about something you know, like talk about something you're really interested in. Exactly. It's, it's the dream. Yeah, if you can just get paid to talk about interesting stuff all day which hopefully is what you do if you teach a subject that you enjoy. Um, exactly. And you'll have seen the same as what I saw. There was like definitely two or three people in the in the group who could do it, and everyone else was terrified of it, <laughs> which I found really funny because it was like, ah, you guys could be teachers, and you guys probably don't want to be teachers. Absolutely, absolutely. Though I, I, I think even when I started my PGC, to some extent, I was still nervous to get up and stand yeah. stand in front of a full class. Um, that, is, that is one thing I'm pretty sure with. we can come to that come back to that idea in a second um so go on where did you do your pgce liverpool for your undergrad yeah i did university of liverpool for my undergrad and then i went straight to edge hill which is in ormskirk not too far away from liverpool um to do my pgc they were a good pgc provider in the area so i was like nailed it that's that sounds like a really good thing to do um i went i went there i had uh, two placements um one of them was in wigan wigan which is like a, a town up north not famously a particularly nice town quite historic but um Famous for schools. its pies, famous for its yeah. rugby. It, they love the pies up there, mate, I'll tell you. Um, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, the school was amazing. I had a really, really good time there. Met some the colleagues, you know, the students. It was a really nice uh, sort of community vibe to the school. And I thought I'd get the same when I went to my second placement, which was in Skelmersdale. But um, it wasn't the same. But Skelmersdale is not a nice place to go. But we'll talk about that probably more later. What about your PGC, Sam? What did you do? I should imagine so. Uh, well, I did my undergrad at Manchester. That was my pure biology degree. Um, and then after that, I went to Newcastle. So I went kind of even further north and across the country and went all the way up uh, to meet the Geordies. And I absolutely loved it. It was great. I lived just outside Newcastle. My first placement was in North Shields, um, which when your surname is Shields as well is... You know, ironic and and you know it suits well yeah but and, and as if, i mean as if the accent was enough for the students to bully um <laughs> you know the name was enough to cotton on as well yeah um but d- i had a great time that school honestly was probably one of the better schools that i've that i've ever worked in the staff were great the kids were kind of punky but kind of great in their own way as well um and i, I genuinely learned like a lot about teaching from a lot of really really good members of staff and great technicians um and some good administrators as well you often get like amazing management but even the management were pretty good um at like investing in you and making sure you're ready for interview and you're ready to actually get a job and go into the profession properly nice um so yeah i really enjoyed it and then post christmas that's uh that's when it all changed because just like <laughs> you i got a new i got a new placement this was at a school in blythe which is um industrial town on the coast so really similar to where i grew up um you know a bit of a, an industrial town that's had its heyday is now on a few kind of harder times and there's some really really good schools there and some really really good kids there but the school that i got put in was super super strict so the kids were really kind of quashed they had to be quiet um they were very very strict on rules and behavior which you know in terms of the day-to-day running of the school, it looked to all intents and purposes like things are going strong and nice and quiet and everything is as it should be. But actually, I, I wonder if that's the best way to do education, kind of stifling people and stifling creativity yeah. and, and kind of you know having to do it the same all day, every day, putting people into these boxes to make them behave. Um, and, and yeah, I, I learned a lot about what not to do or what I didn't want in my own practice there, which to some extent was, was still quite beneficial. Yeah, I feel like that's a good, maybe a good little little side conversation. I mean, like, if, in my experience, working at schools with super hammered down rules, 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 everybody follows these strict sort of puts, like you say, putting people into boxes, it, it creates a culture, not just with the students, but also with the staff of a lack of creativity. I felt, I mean, whenever I've worked in a school that's, that's similar to that, I feel like I can't try new things, I can't have, you know, fun lessons because it doesn't sort of, get behind the school's 
the school's culture in a way. It's strange. Yeah, kind of the ethos. No, I absolutely get that. And I feel like, as well as that, it's just it's become stifling when there's so many rules and trying to do the mental gymnastics of jumping through all the hoops to, to meet every expectation, whether you're a staff or a student, is, is impossible. Um, I seem to remember somebody mentioning that they had one rule in their classroom. They needed one rule in their classroom. And that one rule in their classroom was, you know, I'm in charge. <laughs> and, and, that's, and, that's, but, and that's the only rule you need and the, and the kids trust that they trust that when you say um, you'll be learning about X, Y, or Z today that that's what you'll be learning and when you tell them to be quiet they need to be quiet and you don't need lists of rules and rules and behaviour and regulations and checks you know just trust me I'm in charge like just that. trust me and, and, and then that's the only rule you need there's, there's no confusion um, and that, that clarity I think is, is quite important so there needs to be structure but it, it can't be oppressive I suppose yeah I like that um, I've already learned something this podcast is already worth doing well worth it maybe we should just yeah. hang it up there then <laughs> um okay so let's talk highlights of the pgc because it is quite a, i suppose a formative time for a teacher it should be um yeah. so what was your kind of highlight of your your pgc well i sort of i'd say i had two um yeah first of all it was quite it was kind of like a bittersweet moment i was leaving my first placement i got really really close with a year seven class mm-hmm. um and i was i had i was there with, with a teacher we were team teaching and she gave me a lot of freedom to sort of how do my do my thing with teaching so as a result relationships with the kids were really really nice and when i left that placement then i mean they all brought me cards that they handmade you know and they were, they were super personalized it was so so nice and um, that was one highlight uh, the second one was in, in the, the dark depths of my second placement and um, <laughs> when i when i got my first post and i could see there was light at the end of a tunnel and it was a really good school you know, teaching straight physics, which I was hoping I'd be able to do. So that was kind of like that sort of shining beacon. <laughs> that's that kind of the holy through. grail, especially, yeah. especially for a science teacher. I mean, we're both in the sciences. Being able, being able to have you know, the majority of your timetable being the subject that you really enjoy, biology for me, physics for you, is, exactly. is quite liberating, I guess. Yeah. Um, absolutely, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever had to teach anything other than straight biology? Uh, yeah, so uh, biology, chemistry, and physics up to GCSE. Um, yeah, so that was with your PGCE. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so really familiar with that. Um, and at, at other schools, I've kind of dipped into the departments a little bit of physics lesson here or um, a bit of biology yeah. here. Interestingly, actually, um, at my new place, I've tried to do some team teaching. So I'll go over with my class to um, like the RE department. And if they're doing evolution, I'll go in with a bit of a biology perspective and some facts. Ah. Um, oh, nice. A yeah. little exactly, bit of contrast. Yeah. Um, a little bit of contrast, but interesting to see what common ground there is as well. Interesting to see, um, you know, the I don't know the theological arguments they put up against evolution, and then you can actually kind of hash those out with some yeah. facts in the game as well. Um, I like that. Same with design. I think the amount that you can do as a science teacher, if you get on well with your kind of design teachers, um, that opens a lot of doors. A yeah. lot of doors, especially for like STEM and science projects and things like that. Yeah. Definitely. yeah. We've got um we've got a technician who's super hands on for stuff like that. She's constantly making, you know, resources and things. So yeah, that sort of design aspect gives it sort of a, another angle, doesn't it? Absolutely, God, absolutely, it does, definitely. So go on then. Highlights of your PGC? Oh, okay. How's my PGC? Um, I think similar to you, I had a really really good mentor in my first placement school um you know it's it's touchy at first and you're trying to get a feel for each other and you're trying to see you know what experiences your mentor got what kind of person are they what are their interests what do they bring into the classroom that's them um and, and he and i were just you know off the same page both a little bit geeky both a little bit nerdy both open to trying weird crazy ideas you know i was doing um starters for his lessons with lego blocks we were coming out with all this practical work i think you know, we built um board games for education we built i built a digestive system out of plumbing parts with the oh, technician as well yeah which is i'm, I'm, I'm working on a, on, a, on a redraft of it at the moment which Ooh. will hopefully be a better and be more watertight <laughs> um, which is is a key fact a, a kind of key part of, of a plumbing part digestive system is yeah, that it doesn't yeah. kind of pour all over the floor um but he yeah honestly he gave me complete creative freedom in that class and he was always really supportive and if it wasn't going well we'd reflect on why we um kind of plan things together we teach together by the end he was just sat at the back doing his marking and i was kind of in full flow and it, it was like a real kind of passing of the torch sort of thing yeah. um which to say i was only six seven eight weeks in was was quite rewarding um so definitely definitely valued that um i suppose to some extent yeah getting my getting my uh kind of permanent post applying for jobs uh in my second placement and knowing it would it'll be over soon there'll be a big summer you would be out of there because I, I don't know about you but i made like a lot of mistakes Oh yeah, <laughs> a lot of things I would rather 
That's what it's all about. Differently, yeah, exactly. So, so knowing that you you can parachute in, screw it all up, and and get right back out, um, and it's not going to affect the kids too much. It's not going to affect you too much. Um, yeah. there's some value in that. Absolutely. I feel that's not be a nice segue into the next into 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 a nice talking point later down the line. Mm. And maybe should we go for that now? What do you go think? for it? Go for it. Yeah. yeah why is, not? What was the most valuable lesson then that you learned on you on your PGC? Most valuable lesson. One one really stands out, and it's such a small niche thing. And I learned it the hard way because I'm an idiot. Um, I I remember I remember being petrified before I started my PGCE about would the kids behave? Would they yeah. listen? Would they care about what I had to say? Would they just mess about and be alone to themselves? Like who am I? Just some skinny northern lad? Like they're not listen to me. Um, so I read all these books on behavior and behavior management. And yep. tried to get a feel for good techniques and things to avoid. And one of the things that was in one of these books was, you know, never, never call the kid up to the front of the class to try and teach the lesson. Don't do that. That's bad. That's bad news. You can kind of see where it's going, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to teach this class, uh, year nine class, who were uh, kind of, it's my own fault that they weren't on side. I wasn't kind of as structured as I should have been. New to the school, trying to learn uh, their behavior management policy and not really applying it just as I, as I should have done. Um, so I'm, I'm getting to lose my temper a bit and they're just talking away. They're not really listening. They're not really learning anything. And this kid's getting kind of cocky and a bit back chatty. So I said, well, why, come on then. Why don't you come up and teach the lesson? And he comes and he stands at the front. And I say, off you go then. And he goes, I can't, sir. And I'm like, why is that? Thinking he's going to go. I wasn't listening, so I can't do it, sir. But no, in front of, I've given him an audience now of 30 kids yep. um, for him to stand up there and go, I can't teach you, sir, because you've not taught us anything. <laughs> um, which... <laughs> Yeah, well, funnily enough, that was the reaction of the 30 teenagers yeah. in the room as well. <laughs> yeah, um, that is checkmate. <laughs> yeah, and, and you got to hold your hands up and say, get out of my classroom. Uh, yeah. Because what else can you say? You, you really, yeah, I completely put myself in the worst position. Yeah. Uh, and I was mortified, and the kids were just rolling, laughing, and the teacher yeah. at the back of the room was just shaking her head, going like, yeah, this is, you, 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 everyone's got to learn. Kid. <laughs> yeah, everyone's got to learn, and, and this is you learning. Um, I never did that again. I've never done that since in the past five years, and I yeah. don't intend on doing it. Yeah. Um, I think my behavior management's got a lot better, but that was like, even though I'd read it, even though I knew, um, don't do it, I kind of had to go through it to see just how bad it could be, to, to have it kind of burned into my memory. It wasn't just yeah. a fact in a book anymore. It was like quite a visceral experience. <laughs> Get laughed and ridiculed at by 30 kids. Yeah, you don't do that again. So that no. was definitely probably a... a yeah, a valuable lesson, certainly in behavior management. Yeah. Um, what about you? Any big valuable lesson? Um, for me, uh, it's it's learning that the PGCE was not the be all and end all. I remember having like these observations and I'd get like, you know, a, a, a requires improvement or, you know, a good when I was hoping for outstanding and thinking like, that's it. It's I'm, I'm never going to be a good teacher. And then as soon as you leave your PGCE, they never ask you what you got <laughs> on your PGCE because people say like, "Oh, I came out with an outstanding average." But nobody cares. Yeah, absolutely like, nobody cares. Nobody cares. You don't start learning to be a teacher until you finish your PGCE. It's very much like learning to drive in that respect. Yeah, I definitely agree with that, and I feel like as well. Um, yeah, teaching is just so different once you get out there. It really doesn't matter if you're outstanding. Um, you're still going to start off as a rookie in a new school with new colleagues, with people you've never met, with students you've never met, with whole systems of behavior management um, that you've just never seen before. So yeah. as outstanding as you are in your six months to, uh, to a year of placement, it's going to be completely different when you actually get out yeah. and get into a classroom. It's not 100% analogous. Like your, pl your classroom skills will transfer with you. You know, the things that you're good at will stay the things that you, you're good at as you move past your PGCE. But, um, you know, you'll never be perfect at the end of the day, will you? There's no such thing as a perfect teacher. There's no one teacher who, like, you know, everybody has to do it like them because that's not how it works. Like, for me personally, my lessons, my behavior management has, ne nev has never necessarily been front and center of what I'm trying to do. I don't have silent classrooms. And sometimes that'll lead to, you know, periods of being less, less productive. But at the same time, it also leads to students really enjoying my lessons and being on board with what I'm trying to do. So, you know. Like, absolutely, I agree with that. And I feel like as well, you know, I mean, I worked in a school which for six months, that second placement was strictly silence. I had um, a member of senior management prowling the hallways and he came in one time to a lesson um, to, to tell the kids off because they were being you know, boisterous and they were chatting and they were talking about the work and they were making posters and whatever they were doing um, but they were chatting away and he came in ready to you know 
give them both barrels and he saw me at the back talking to one and he said oh, i'm really sorry i didn't know there was a, a member of staff in here um yeah he just thought they were just completely these these wild children i was like no this is kind of how i want my classroom and and i'm kind of free to run it how i want to some extent um, yeah. and i think you know if a school is flexible they'll let you iron out your own style and have your own way of doing it so you know that boisterous class that you talk about or the noisy class that is also giving some kids a chance to just switch off for those two minutes they need to like get a bit of mental energy back and just process something exactly um, you know everyone needs that 30 second break that two minute break you can't expect hour in hour out all the way through the day those yeah. those kids are just gonna be absolutely on it and intense there's got to be that lull that downtime yeah, even you can't, every, can't do 10 it minutes or so maybe yep I, tell you, I don't know if you've ever taught a double period I'm, I'm currently teaching an A-level class where it, it's one lesson that goes straight into another lesson. Yeah. And I, I, I call it a 10-minute comfort break in the middle of the lesson. Actually, if I'm being completely honest, I call it a 10-minute dump break. If anyone needs to go grab a coffee, or go to the toilet, you've got 10 minutes, off you go. And, and it almost re- sort of resets them, ready for the second half of the lesson. Some of them work through it anyway, you know, and fair play to them. But you can't frazzle them, especially not when it's like that, that, that double period starts at 4 <laughs> No, it starts at three and finishes at five. You know, it, it, that's killer, isn't it? That it, is it is. They don't enjoy it. Let's put it that way. No, I bet not. I remember on my um, yeah second placement. Basically, if I'm going to talk about a bad experience where I learned a lesson, second placement is where it's going to be. <laughs> um, I had um, a bottom set year ten class. I think they were year ten set seven or something. Um, yeah. Only maybe twelve or thirteen students in, in the group, um, but they had a double lesson which went on for about two hours 15 minutes two hours 20 Oof, minutes yeah yeah it was 70 minute lessons or so so it was yeah it was a big stretch and they didn't even necessarily get that 10 minute comfort break because um there just wasn't that kind of in the timetable so instead it was up to me in my lesson planning to plan in a little quiz or a little practical or a change of activities or something a bit more creative or a bit of a chat or conversation or something off topic you know something just to to break the time up otherwise yeah. you know it's it's a mammoth two hours to fill with students who you know can't focus for that amount of time for all sorts of different reasons um, yeah but i think yeah i think i think it's, it's one of those especially with a with you know bottom bottom sets quite often it can feel like cra- crowd control as well can't it because you get those kids in the bottom set who are you know they mean well but but and, and, but they're just not that bright but you can also get the kids who are bright enough to be higher up but just a classroom environment isn't was not made for them Oh, gotcha. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've had classes where some kids can barely write their own name and they really need the help and they really need that small class size and that focus to just kind of get them through some some syllabus points um, and get a bit of an understanding of the subject. Um, and in the same class, kids who are perfectly bright and absolutely fine and could be three, four, five, six sets higher, um, but they're too busy dragging each other off each other's chairs and stealing matches and stealing scalpels. Yeah. And like I've been there. And yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy. I mean, in a rough school, it, as soon as you're doing any practical with a powder, that powder is getting formed into a line, isn't it? Straight yeah. away, without without <laughs> a shadow of a doubt. Any just, any practical work with dissection, count the scalpels out, count the scalpels in. Like it becomes I've been in prison. Like a, ex- well, I tell you what, some I don't know if this was the same for you, but up in Newcastle, some of the people I did my PGC with, they were in schools where there were kind of you know emergency buttons on the on the walls. So wow. if if kids, yeah, if kids really, I mean, fortunately, I never had to teach in those schools, but I saw their experiences. And to some extent, you know, you are thrown in at the deep end. What a horrible kind of first experience of teaching, just firefighting all the time. These kids with massive behavioral problems. Yeah. Um, but they come out the other side. Look what you survived. Look what you can do. If you can do that, you can deal with anything. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it really is kind of trial by fire. Absolutely. Um, let's have a look at another question then. Why not? So mm-hmm. um, how, yeah, how do you think your teaching's changed? since your um, PGCE days? So my PGCE, has. I mean, I remember leaving my PGCE and the most valuable piece of advice I ever received was teaching is all about relationships. Um, and that was from a guy who was like one of the best behavior management sort of technicians I've ever seen in my entire life. He, was, he just had them eating out the palm of his hand no matter what set it was. Um, he said teaching is all about relationships. So that's something I've, I've, I've taken with me. And that's one way that it, that it stayed the same. It, that's sort of been a a mainstay of my my style of teaching but in recent years I've got really into like research based teaching and creative teaching I'm always trying to do new things it's it's actually a bit of a killer because every time I come to teach anything 
I'm designing it all from scratch again. I never just re- like wheel out a lesson that I've used in the past until recently where I managed to get like an entire syllabus of stuff I considered sort of valuable and entertaining in equal measures um, for my year nine classes. Um, so yeah, that's one way it's one way that it's changed. But at, at, at the same time, it's I've got tried to be a bit more, I think the word's intentional with what I'm doing. You know, because I quite often you'll know what good practice is, but it's when someone points out to you. So, for example, um, when you start reading about retrieval practice for the first time, it's, you know, you'll think, oh, I've been doing that all this time. Here it is written down in research. And so that that's one another way that my, my teaching's changed, you know, trying to be a bit more research based and intentional with what I'm doing. Absolutely. And then quite often communicating that with the kids can be really useful as well, telling them about you know, space practice, retrieval practice, the value of that, building it yeah. into your lessons, I think is something that's really important and teachers don't do enough. You do you know, want to building... explain, do you want to explain just for the lesson, I'm just going to cut right across you that's uh, fine. in an ignorant fashion. Uh, do you want to explain perhaps what retrieval practice, what space practice are? Yeah, so um, these are two, two points that have been proven by every piece of research that I've come across um, that 100% work for all situations and all students, and that is retrieval practice, which is just just the process of trying to draw some information that's somewhere in your brain to memory, you know, trying to bring it forward, and that strengthens, you know, your your your, your neuron connections. It uh, it means that things move from your working memory into your long-term memory if you keep using that information. Um, the idea is you don't forget it, which brings us on to spaced practice, which is this process of sp- instead of blocking your practice. So say you had two students both doing five hours revision for an exam um, and one of the students blocked it. It was the 24 hours before the exam that did all 24, all five hours of their revision then. And you had a second student who spaced that out in 20 minute blocks, like over weeks building up to the exam um, in pretty much every scenario that they've tested, the student who spaced it out does better on the test. And that's something that we intuitively know. But like I say, it's about being intentional with what you're trying to do and um, telling the kids that, but not just telling them, because we've been telling them that forever. You know, (laughs) if you're anything like me, space your practice out, make sure you don't cram, you should always be revising. We say it, but actually building it into lessons um, can be something that's really useful to do as well. Yeah, and to some extent, I suppose that's a form of kind of metacognition. So if you ever come across metacognitive exercises where you're trying to encourage all manner of transferable skills and actually thinking about how to learn and how to learn better, um, actually explaining why you're doing what you're doing helps students understand that process and helps understand the learning process that they are engaging in. Um, I do wonder if, if if doing space practice and having these 20 minute blocks or so, if that makes a student more intentional it's our intention to perhaps factor it into the syllabus and, and we put it into our lessons but if you've only got 20 minutes to sit down and get through some material perhaps you're more intentional in what you pick out whereas if you're just going to sit there for a full couple of hours or five hours you're just going to read the textbook you're going to highlight some stuff you're going to get oh. bored you're going to go and read more um and it's the textbook <laughs> yeah whereas if you got if, exactly if you've got 20 minutes you're going to hopefully switch on and think what can i yeah. what can i do productively in 20 minutes yeah. you will be That's intentional. two exam questions let's go yeah yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Go on, same to you then. You know, what, uh, how's my how's my teaching changed? Yes, how has it continued to change? Um, so one of the biggest changes that I've made um, has probably been going digital. So my place recently has introduced iPads for most students. They're getting a real big drive on technology in the classroom. Um, and about time too, I suppose, because plenty yeah. of students use it in their own time. Um, and there's plenty of benefits to it if it's executed properly it's just another kind of tool in your arsenal if you like yeah. um so just finding ways to adapt my teachings it's always been relatively creative and kind of niche and you know i like to make my own resources from scratch and i know how they're going to work and they're going to work for me in the way that i want to teach um trying to get that onto some sort of digital system trying to build courses online trying to get used to everything from quizzing apps to assessment apps to um ai driven machinery um all that sort of stuff has just been a massive learning curve over the past uh, 18 months yeah uh, which I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around so what i'm doing at the moment i'm doing a master's with edinburgh in digital education um and Ooh. that is that is yeah that is really helping me i'd recommend if anyone gets the chance for any further 
education once they're qualified you should take it whether it's a master's or it's some sort of diploma or certificate whether it's just a cpd course to go on if it looks like you're going to find it interesting if it's a value to you just just talk to whoever's in charge of cpd and get it funded and get on it it's it's definitely worth it if if the school's got the resources to do it um yeah that's nice. I'd, I'd say that's the big thing. Yeah, just just yeah. just like you said with getting into research, just getting into something that you can really explore that just keeps informing your practice. Yeah, um, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what. I know you've spoken to me about about your master's course, and I bet we could do an entire episode on that in the future. It's so interesting. Well, when we scrape the barrel for ideas, we absolutely can. <laughs> there we go. That's one <laughs> one more episode ticked. Thank you very much. Nice. Backed away for a future date. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that sounds like all fun things. I think I think quite often people can get carried away with ed tech, but when it's something like that, it it's you know, it, and you're trying to make it, you know, it's just trying to trying to take the fad the fadism out of ed tech, uh, yeah. isn't it? To a I agree extent. with that. No, I agree. And I I think like you say, it's about being intentional. Anyone can whack on Kahoot for forty five straight minutes to an hour. Um, that isn't a great use of you know a little quizzing app um so it's being intentional and being able to critique these things and being able to see how they're beneficial for your practice how they're beneficial for the students you know it might be that it's great for your practice and it's awful for the students it might be that it's great for the students and you absolutely hate trying to fit it into your style of teaching mm. it's about compromise it's about intention it's about finding what works it's about you know kind of being brave enough to experiment a little bit um and if there's one thing hopefully people take off a of pgc um it's that kind of willingness to try new things yeah. Um, nothing worse than than a teacher who's stuck in their ways and they won't listen to to you know trying. Even if the latest thing is a fad, at least try yeah. it and see why. Yeah. And then you go. can you can bin it off if it's not your thing. But you know, as soon as a teacher stands there and says, oh, "I'm not doing that because I've done it this way forever and it's better," yeah. well, you know, you've got experience, sure, but at least give it a go. At least be open minded. That's what we expect our students to do because they get new material from us day in, day out, all yeah. year. Yeah. I mean, we've all we've all met those members of staff, you know, who, who have been teaching the exact same lessons the exact same way for thirty years, and nothing's changed, and they never try anything new. I remember I was watching an, an, a, an, a a TED talk about by a head teacher who said her favourite thing to say to staff was "Try something new, nobody will die," and I love that. I wrote, is that the one on um, spiraled? That's the curricula. one. Yeah, I think I, I know uh, exactly. Yeah, I think we shared that with one another at some stage. Yeah, well, maybe this is one to put on the website as well. We yeah, probably have we'll a bank put, of expect a link podcasts. there. In, expect in this a link. podcast description. Yeah. If, J- if James remembers, I will remember that. that that's going to happen. I w- I'll try and remind you. Um, so let's have another question. Um, is there anything you didn't value about the PGC? Anything that can just it can just get right out? Yeah, I mean, I mean, PGCs that the not the best experience are they start to finish uh <laughs> this it's go on i, 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 might, mean, I might disagree like, here so, so for on. example so for example at one point i was so stressed with, on my pgc that i remember just i was i was down to have a night with my with my now wife girlfriend at the time and some friends and i just we got out of the car and i just started crying and i didn't know why <laughs> and wow, she was like what's the matter with you and i was like i don't know i'm just feeling I don't know, not great. And she was like, go home. I was like, okay. You know, and it was that, that kind of that kind of stress level that doesn't follow you through. If anybody's currently doing a PGC and is listening or is thinking of doing a PGC, they are stressful, but that stress one day ends. And oh. <laughs> I was going to say, I wonder why that stress ends. I don't know if that stress ends because you become a better teacher and everything just becomes better um, and, and you're more used to it. Or if you've seen the problems before, so they seem less stressful, or maybe you just become so ignorant to them because it's just I mean, the norm now. For um, me, it was it was the fact that you're constantly being judged. Mm, I, I yeah. couldn't deal with that. I was constantly judging myself. You know, you'll have a bad lesson and you'll be painfully aware of it. Whereas nowadays you'll have a bad lesson and you can kind of go, oh, I'll just shake that one off, you know, and it, straight away you can forget about it. As long as you te- when you teach it next time, you know, you learn from the mistakes you've made. But with a PGCE, every one of those is under the microscope. You know, there's a member of staff in there with you, like you say, sh- sat at the back of the room shaking their head. Yeah, and absolutely. You don't, like, there's, if there's one person in the room who is so aware of the mistakes that they're making, it's the, it's the person at the front, you know, and that's something that I think, I personally, I didn't value about a PGC, but at the same time, the learning experience is so much more vivid as a result of that constantly being under the microscope. 
if you make a mistake, the fact that you you said that that one mistake you made when you invited the kid up to teach the class is still yeah, let's not let's not hash that out too much. It still etched hurts. into your memory. It's like <laughs> it's like a brand that will never heal. You know, it, 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 you're never going to forget that. So in in a way, the, the things that not. you learn, even in my nursing home, riddled with all sorts of you know. Um, memory related diseases the one thing that i'm sure will curse me till the day i die is calling that kid up God, it's never gonna go guy. away <laughs> yeah and i'll and i'll never do it again um as long as i ever shall teach because it just backfired immediately yeah go um on, then. you were gonna you were gonna argue with me about i was gonna it. argue yeah because i found that I've, I've now thought of something that i didn't value on the whole i do think they're pretty valuable even though they're really really stressful i think there is value in experiencing that um you know, you don't want to go into the teaching profession under any illusions. I've known mm. a few people who come in having not done a PGCE and having done teacher training, either no teacher training or they've got into it in a roundabout way and they've not got the proper PGCE. Um, and quite often they're caught, you know, rabbit in the headlights. They've got no idea what to expect. They're thrown yeah. in at the deep end. They've not they built that tolerance that, a, that, yeah, exactly. They've not got that tolerance that a PGCE perhaps gives you to some of the stress and some of the unknowns and some of that unexpected sort of stuff so i do think there's a lot of value in them um even even when i was you know dark depths placement too um i still felt like i was learning something mm-hmm. i was learning what not to do i was learning how not to run a school and how not to behave um yeah. but even that what i found was quite important in forming my ideas of what kind of teacher i wanted to be yeah um, I one thing i think uh, was mis- oh, go on, sorry, sorry go on. well i was gonna say one thing that i didn't value about the course or one thing i wish was there that wasn't um was some proper instruction on how to observe lessons yeah like i don't know about you but for our for our first placement you spent the first half term just observing you yeah. might do the odd starter of a lesson but that was like six weeks observing four or five lessons a day uh, and then writing up reflections and thoughts and ideas and doing lesson plans and all the rest of it um but no one actually sat down and said, here's some good principles for observing. When you're in there, this is how to make the most of being an active observer. It was very much take a pen, take a bit of paper, sit at the back, maybe chat to the kids if there's a group exercise. You know, just keep out of the way sort of thing. Don't yeah. don't take up too much space. Just sit yeah. and watch. Now um, you come to mention it, I, it did feel like those first six weeks were very much like a quarantine period. <laughs> but a we can't bit. trust you to teach anyone yet, but just be there, be at the school. I love it. And I'll tell you what I found. What One thing that was beneficial, I, that finally clicked, I was bored a little bit because, yeah. because I was going in there and I was watching a teacher teach. So I was no longer an observer. I'd just become another year seven student. <laughs> I was just sat there and he was saying, this is an alkali and this is a base. I'm like, yeah, alkali. But I was like, no, wait, hold on. I shouldn't be looking at this. I should yeah. be, you know, with, this is what I wish I'd known. I should have been looking at the kids. I should have been looking at the kids and going, little Dave at the back has, has fallen asleep. Um, why is that? What should the teacher be doing differently to help get Dave engaged? What you know is this just going to be an hour-long lecture? How can we break that up? Because I'm getting bored. If I'm getting bored, they're going to get bored. Yeah. Um, maybe we should have a whole less uh, a whole uh, podcast on good observing. What it is to be a good observer. What you can do to get the most out of that. Because it is six weeks is a long time, and you can learn a lot. Like now, I feel like I learn a lot from observing a lesson. But back then, probably less. Yeah, so. I mean. To a certain extent, you're observing having had no previous experience as well. So there'll be things there that you don't see, that you don't you don't quite grasp. But nowadays, when you go to observe a lesson, you're seeing it through the lens of an experienced teacher, you know. And you're seeing you're seeing the things that they're doing. You go, oh, I see what they did there. That's quite cool. But someone going in as a PGC student for the first six weeks won't necessarily see all those little things. You know, and they, they, they won't have a, a bank of knowledge as well. So if you do have a teacher just doing an hour of chalk and talk, if you went to school and that's all you know when you were at school was chalk and talk, then you're not necessarily going to know there's anything else. But if you get a teacher that's going and being super creative, for example, then you, unless you get that, you're not going to know the opposite side of the coin, so to speak. If that makes no, sense. I, I agree with that, yeah. And, and definitely you know, for some teachers, that kind of chalk and talk, stand at the front of the classroom, right on the board. You know, For some teachers, if you have a really interesting conversational style about you, if you're really good at picking on kids for conversation and asking questions, if your questioning's on point, um, maybe that could be a really engaging lesson and they're reading out the palm of your hand. Like you say, that could potentially work. Now, that doesn't work for me. Um, I get bored of the sound of my own voice, and they definitely do. Um, you know, the less I'm talking and the more I'm walking around facilitating, the better for me. Um, yeah. But then Same sometimes, <laughs> yeah. But but then sometimes you hit that lesson and it's just dense information that you couldn't work out on your own, and you just need someone to stand at the front with a diagram and say, "Look, this is kind of how it works, guys." Yeah. 
Um, let and me explain through 10 different analogies. Yeah, and, you know, and, and it might take 40 minutes or so, but you know, better to just pause and do that because perhaps you know, sometimes just saying it is the best way to do it, and sometimes it isn't. Yeah. But you kind of learn that, I think, from, from your own practice. Yeah. There's some material uh, that you can't move on until you've nailed it. Isn't there? Like, if you think, I'm thinking about maths, like mm. fractions, decimals, and percentages. That is something that everybody needs to know. And if a maths teacher moves on, having not, with all the students not having necessarily grasped that, they moved on too soon. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I feel like, but that's that's true of so many subjects. Is just building the foundation. That's why in biology you often start with uh, biochemistry and molecules, and you start with cell structure and just mm -hmm. the real, real basics. You know, here's a microscope. How do you use it before you ever get onto the advanced stuff? Because yeah. for my A-level students, if they're doing, um, I don't know, root tip squash, they're looking at mitosis, they're staining cells, they're squashing these root tips, they're getting them under the microscope, um, or they're measuring something with a graticule. I'm taken for granted that hopefully in years past they've learned how to use a microscope because it's such a an automatic thing of, of, of you know the, the real learning is in is in how the cell division works i yeah. can't also be teaching them the basics of here this this how you switch on your microscope or whatever yeah. it is mm -hmm. um so considering in the next few episodes we're going to be talking about teaching standards um you know all i think eight of them and a bit of um personal professional conduct as well um, yep. how important are those teaching standards in your everyday teaching i think they're one of those things where a, a teacher who, who knows their craft and has been doing it a long time will go through those and pick them up almost at random. You know, it, not, I'm going to say not, not at random, but maybe more by accident. So, for example, if you were looking at the first one about setting high expectations, you are automatically, as a teacher, going to set high expectations for your students. And it's not until necessarily reflecting on that, and I think this is what we'll do in future, in future episodes, it's not until you do that that you say, actually, you know, that is important. Um, and we are meeting those, even if it is by accident. But again, we come back to being intentional with those. You know, can, how intentional can you be with all those eight points? Um, is it you know, a good way to sort of build your lesson, maybe from starting from there rather than from well, the yeah. content? That's the, I, I, do. I suppose to some extent, like there's there's eight of them, and they don't stand in isolation. You can't plan your lesson where you say we're going to have five minutes on standard one and five minutes on standard two. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick off by setting high expectations. Then I'm going to plan the lesson, and then I'm going to differentiate it and then assess it. And then you know maybe I'll, be, I'll manage some behavior in the in the 35th to 40th minute. Like yeah. it's they all kind of have to start coming together. But to some extent, you know, if you're quite good on your discipline and you're saying, hey, Dave, back of the room, time to quiet down, get on with some work. You know, you're keeping the behavior of the class in line in quite a straightforward way, um, but you're also setting better expectations for him because you want him to get on with the work and get a better grade and you can see he's not doing that if he's chatting away. Um, yeah. You know, you're building a nice atmosphere for success in your classroom. Um, or they all begin to kind of mingle together, I think. They definitely don't stand in isolation. Some of them are almost the same one. Like, in my mind, if you're doing number one, like I say, set high expectations for all students, then you're also doing number five, which is adapt teaching to respond to the strengths and needs of all pupils. Mm. You know, the, you can't have one without the other, you know. If you're not yeah, absolutely setting high expectations, then you're not going to be, of, of all the students, then you're not responding to the strengths and needs. That differentiation starts in having high expectations. Gotcha. Well, that's like that's the crossover between two and five as well. Um, do you want to promote good progress where you best differentiate your lesson because if yeah. you don't differentiate some kids will fly and some will flounder and some will get abandoned in the middle so yeah. if you want that good progress differentiate if you want that two good and progress, six as well assess yeah absolutely absolutely and plan if you want good progress plan yeah. they, don't, they definitely don't they're all sit in isolation yeah, yeah. Um, I, and i think to some extent at least for me a lot of them just become automatic yeah. I'm always looking to add that extra detail and push that bit of knowledge and, and throw in that extra question in the last few minutes to make sure I've got the most out of that kid's understanding. Um, and the part of that is assessment and questioning, a part of that is just promoting their good progress, and part of it is managing the behavior of the classroom and always keeping the pace up and keeping them on task. And it all begins to blend the more of it you do, I think. Yeah, yeah I'd agree. What's the most recent sort of teaching and learning light bulb, you can't see it, but I'm doing inverted commas, moment that you've had? Ooh, the most recent teaching and learning light bulb, the thing that's kind of clicked for me. Yeah. Um, good question. I, I suppose part of it, I, I'm going to plug my masters again, part of it is, is trying to convert all this stuff to being digital education. Um, yeah. It's just, I suppose, trying to see what existed in my practice before and how I can incorporate it to be fun and interesting and all the rest of it, but through a completely new medium. Um, so 
putting in your space retract um, space practice and retrieval practice is one thing um, but I was also quite a big proponent of metacognition that's one of those big things uh, that I learned in my PGCE I trialed it a bit in my first few years as NQT and now I think I'm getting relatively hot on um, yeah. is building um, problems and puzzles and ways of applying knowledge um, and adding that kind of depth so I'm not stood at the front saying here's a diagram learn the diagram all right see you next time yeah she's like starting off the lesson by saying well here's a problem how are we going to solve it? What skills have we got to solve it? What's our problem solving going to be like? Um, and trying to teach them transferable skills as well. I find, especially in biology, but probably across all subjects, transferable skills kind of teach them every opportunity you get, whether it's um, practical skills or um, experimental design skills or you know knowing your accuracy from your reliability from your precision. Um, all those little things that kind of go hand in hand with most lessons, um, yeah. which can be, they can be easy to gloss over. But I think now, five years in, I'm finally beginning to kind of mesh those in and get those nailed. Yeah. And again, dear PGCE people, five years in is what we're talking about. And when you're starting to finally feel like you've got some mastery over, over your, over your, your practice. If, if you're in your PGCE, and you don't feel like that now, you're not the only one. Yeah. And it doesn't matter about all the rest of the people on your course talking trash about how they nailed it. They've got, Oh, I got an outstanding observation. You'll have moments where you feel like you are trash because everyone around you is getting outstandings and you're not but most of them are just trying to make themselves feel and look better because they have no idea what they're doing either absolutely god yeah um and anyone who goes and you know on the flip side and says oh, i've got this all worked out i know it all i'm already outstanding what am i going to learn like not the person to fraternize with not don't surround yourself with yeah. people who are telling you that they know it all surround exactly. yourself especially when you get especially if you get a job and you get I say if, when, because teachers are in pretty high demand. When you get that job and you leave your PGC and you're qualified, surround yourself with the teachers who haven't got it worked out and they've kind of got their own niche style and they're a bit kind of punky and rough around the edges um, and they've kind of got it worked out for them. But what works for them doesn't work for you and take what you can and scrap the rest and just try and build your own style, I guess, because even now I'm trying to work out what my teaching style is meant to be. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are definitely, in, in a way, that's quite there are two types of teachers they're the ones who every single day are trying to think new things and there are ones who every single day feel like they don't need to try new things because they've got it nailed and one of those groups will one day become really good teachers and one of them will stay mediocre forever yeah absolutely i agree with that and i feel like as well um you know you, there will be days where you're rushed off your feet you had you know a busy weekend something unexpected came up and like you, you're just gonna have to go in and dig out some old powerpoint and just get through it and it's yeah. going to get a bit chalk and talk or it's exam season and you're stressed off your venue. It's just going to be a bit of a lecture and it fills an hour and sorry to the kids who are falling asleep. Like that's going to happen. That doesn't make you a bad teacher. Yeah. That's just life. Um, as, as long as you recognize that you don't want that to be the norm and you feel a bit awkward and guilty for doing it, but it's just you're going to have to get your head down and get through. That's fair enough. Everyone has days like that. It's yeah. when it's just chronically seen as, yeah, this is great. I smashed that one out of the park as opposed to oh, I didn't want to do it like that, but I had to. I'll do it different next year. When I've got more yeah. time, I'll plan it properly. That's and, that's the angle, I think. And quite often, you know, improving a lesson year on year isn't about starting from scratch and doing something completely different. So, like, for example, um, I, I teach a lesson on acceleration where I get the students to push my car down a road, and then we work out the acceleration of the car. I'd like to um, point out that's genius on so many levels. Um, they, the, the kids love it, but uh, I bet you know, they do. I bet the health and safety department don't. Yeah, they're not huge fans, but it's <laughs> like I've done my risk assessment. I know it's safe. I think. Um, so I'm never going to drop that. You know, that is a, my acceleration lesson for year nine physics is going to be that every time because I love it. The kids love it. It gets the point across, but then that lesson is still always, I'm always going to try and improve it because I learn something new every time. You know, there's things that you can't do. This time, for example, I had a student um, with a prosthetic leg and it was, how do I get him in, into, into, into the lesson without him feeling left out? You know, he's yeah, got absolutely. Yeah. actual, like physically pushing a car might not be the best idea for him. But I don't want to leave him out. So it was like trying to tailor the lesson. You're always trying. You're always changing your lessons. That's the point I'm trying to make. Anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I, I often find this really bugs me. Even five years in. So get for like look forward to this, guys. Um, when you open that PowerPoint that you used last year, and you're like, I'm sure I've got some resources from last year. I'll just see what I did. And you look at it, and you're short of time, and you go. Oh, I didn't plan it very well last year. I remember yeah. this. This uh, is trash. <laughs> guess I'm guess I'm going to do the same again because it's next lesson and I don't have time to change it. Yeah. Um, that is that is going to happen. I've got lessons like James said that you know I I designed I designed a, an enzyme lesson 
it was actually my interview lesson that got me a job god knows how um on on enzymes and it was using um, a whole bunch of different enzyme models so it was scissors and paper and it was uh, play-doh and cookie cutters and molds for it and all the rest of it um i, I don't think i'll ever get rid of that kids like playing with play-doh it models it quite nicely enzymes aren't going to change in my lifetime um so i'm always going to dig that out but by the same token i'll have plenty of you know thrown together slapdash powerpoints that i wish i didn't have to dig out every year but i've just not got around to changing yet because there's forever a new idea a new initiative something new on the syllabus there's always something. And that might be a good time to mention that if anyone who's listening has any ideas like cool lesson stuff like that, that is exactly what we want to see. Like, but from a purely selfish point of view, I want to see cool lesson stuff. So if you've got anything like that, please, please feel free to send it in to us. There are going to be contact details. I believe there are contact details on the website. So if you've got any cool stuff that you just want to show off about, that's fine. We'd love to see it. Absolutely. And I think in the coming weeks, hopefully, we'll set some more up on the website whereby we can have um, articles from teachers. If you want to send in your lesson plan, your resources, a picture of what you're doing and just say, this is what I do. It works great. Or this is what I do. It has the potential to be great, but it's currently kind of falling apart a little bit. We'd love to have it on, chat about it, talk about it, put it up there for people to see. You know, it's just about sharing good practice, um, which I think is something that yeah. can, can go by the wayside, which we don't really want to do. Love that. If we could start doing that with, with this podcast, I'd be the happiest man. Yeah, well, we can start doing it because we're both teachers. So even if we're the only people putting stuff yeah. up, that'd be pretty sad. That. But we're, we're it would, it would be sad. Yeah, <laughs> but we would we would very much like input because we are not. This is it. I think it's worth saying we're not the best at this. I don't want people coming to this podcast saying these guys are you know I don't know education gurus or they're really well qualified. Like I'm not. I'm just a I'm a bog standard science teacher. I do the best I can do, and I'm still learning it like everyone else is. Yeah, said said every teacher ever. Or at least they should. Yeah, yeah. I'm definitely not. You know, there's some things I think I do well, and there's plenty of things I don't think I do very well. No. Um, so the more I can share, the better. Um, I feel like we should begin to kind of draw this to some sort of close. Yeah, so we've, we've I've, been I've recording thought... for uh, for 50, 57 minutes now. So okay, so let's let's tie this let's tie this up to a neat hour. Then I'm going to give you two statements that crop up in every PGT in every school the world over, and I just want to get your thoughts, like quick gut reaction. Fire. So first one, don't smile before Christmas. I hate that guy. <laughs> I on. hate that guy. Why, why do because, we hate Don't Smile Before Christmas? First of all, like we've all been there where you come in in September and you think like, oh, last year, you know, there was times where I kind of let go of the reins a little bit. This time I'm going to do Don't Smile Before Christmas. And and straight away, first lesson, first minute of the first lesson, I'm cracking jokes with my students and I can't help myself. I constantly do it and I hate myself for it. So which, on one hand, I hate the person that says Don't Smile Before Christmas and can get away with it. They are that person. But then at the same time, I don't feel like Don't Smile Before Christmas should be something that we're aiming for. like Because relationships don't get built with between students and robots. They get built between students and people. And if you're the kind of person that has a good sense of humor, like use it. It can be one of your biggest strengths. Absolutely. What do you think about Don't Smile Before Christmas? I feel like it's a complete load of rubbish. It really annoys me. I don't agree or at least, I, I, I mean, this people can feel free to disagree. I don't think that the best teachers are the ones that wear a mask in front of the kids, where they are, you know, an absolute, I don't know, hard ass all the time, and they're really difficult and they're really strict. But then in the staff room, they're dead joking. They're your best mate, and they always have this like teacher mask on. Um, I feel like if the purpose is to build authentic relationships, a bit of you has to get into your teaching. Um, yeah. That's what kind of makes it memorable. I'd that say. Is- I'd say be consistent until Christmas and ideally after or be professional until Christmas um, while you're building those relationships and setting boundaries. But just just having this idea of like, no fun, don't smile. You know, what happens if something is genuinely funny? Yeah. I, had, um, I had a question, an exam question um, that I was marking away the other day. And it was, um, you know, name structure X and structure X is a chromosome. But this kid doesn't know what chromosome is. So he's put Edward, <laughs> which... <laughs> Yeah, it might be called Edward. It's not. It's it's chromosome thirteen. But maybe it identifies as Edward. Who are you? Maybe it identifies it it. exactly right. But that just makes me crack up because it's so weird, you know. Or John <laughs> looks down a microscope but he doesn't see anything. Why is that? Because John is blind. Um, <laughs> like like that's just yeah, that's pretty funny. Um, I can't I can't not laugh at that. Kids yeah. kids are funny. Working with kids, part of the whole fun of it is they are amusing and they come out with weird wacky stuff. I, I feel like feel free to to laugh and joke and as long as you're professional and they get the boundaries and you know when to rein them back in i'm okay i'm okay with smiling before christmas yeah please um, i'm not going to say you have to but at the same time feel free to yeah and second one last one um don't reinvent the wheel 
Yeah, this is always a difficult one because for me personally, I always feel like I want to put my own stamp on every lesson. Mm. So I'm forever reinventing the wheel. I'm forever going back to even stuff that I've planned and replanning it just because I'm a different teacher than I was one, you know, two years ago. I'm a different teacher all the time. I'm a different teacher, certainly a different teacher to the other people in my department and the other people everywhere. You know, there are times when you can just pull the worksheet off off Tez and just put it into your lesson and it works perfectly well. Or you can find something in a shared server, that you, a resource that works really well. But Good I job. feel don't reinvent the wheel should be an excuse. Should, should be, a, a, you know, an, a, shouldn't be an excuse to be lazy. I agree That's with that, definitely. I feel like, it, especially like, you, you know, you rock up at that PGC school or your new placement or whatever it's going to be, um, or your, your first job, and some old-timer in the department comes up and they say, you know, here's everything we've got on file. Don't reinvent the wheel. And and they've got all your lessons planned and they're all following the same PowerPoints and the same worksheets in the same way. <laughs> yeah, and and I feel like there's a lot of value. Even if I, if, even if I am reinventing the wheel, even if I, you would consider it dead time, it's not dead to me because I'm learning how to craft a lesson. Yeah. I'm, I'm learning how to structure it for my style of teaching. So yeah, I might come out with exactly the same thing. That you know, it's unlikely, but they might have optimized how to teach that subject. It might be the best it could ever be in the history of teaching. Um, I still want to be able to get to that point on my own, as opposed to just take it. Having said that, you know, some of my best lessons I have just stolen right off the photocopier. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes someone just leaves that sheet behind, and you look at it, and you go, "Wow." Damn, that's, that's that's just the starter I was missing. That's that genius. Just <laughs> really well. I had I had one. I still do it, actually. I still do it now. Um, a model that some teachers showed me in my first year of how the lungs work, and it's using a little plastic cup and a little straw and a little balloon, and you seal the whole thing up with um, a plastic glove, and you build like a little model lung, um, and it works really well. And I just took that. I was like, you know what? That is just great. I can't design that better, really. So I'm just going to take that. But then, in years later, I began to think, well, what if I just puncture the cup and i look up you know a collapsed lung what if i block up the the little straw and we have some choking the track is blocked we put some syrup in there and kind of show some kind of tar buildup from like emphysema and um, smoking yeah how can i take what is established and just kind of push it beyond where they put it down you know pick up that pick up that torch yeah i um, mean the wheel's good but it could be better you know yeah what about a wheel that kind of sparkles <laughs> yeah, why not um, what about a wheel that kind of sparkles I think that should be the quote of the day well I'll take that as my quote of the day every, yeah, every, every teacher's got a wheel but I want that little wheel that's kind of a little sparkly it's kind of glittery, it's got like those little little things that make sound on as they spin like when you're a kid on a bike oh, or, or the lights where they flash at the same rate as they're spinning so it puts like a picture that's exactly the kind of lesson I want that's what I'm working towards um, I figure that's what we've got time for this week exactly, yeah nice. I, feel like, I feel like nailed it, good job guys Excellent. Good times. Well, in that case, um, tune in next week or follow us next week or whenever the next one comes up. Um, hopefully they're going to be weekly where we'll begin to look at the different teaching standards. So we'll have a session on setting high expectations, inspiring your pupils, motivating them, challenging them. Um, it's going to be how we do that or how we attempt to do that. Um, ideas that people have, what the research shows, um, all of the above. So yeah stay tuned for that and we look forward to hearing from you if you want to get in touch all of our details are on the website um yeah see you next time cool thanks folks bye-bye